Street here in uh, Phoenix, Scottsdale area. And I want to break this down because this is going to give you a real life case study on what is happening out there in the market in a lot of major markets. All right. This is if you've ever heard the phrase uh, catching a falling knife. This is exactly what we're talking about here. So first off, let me show you where this is at. You can see right here, and this is just the tax records through my MLS, that we closed on this deal for 330000 You can see there's some solid comps just in the area, 650, 738, 699, 650, 830. I mean, this is a smoking deal. But let me show you what happened with this deal here, okay? Or what's, what, what is happening with this deal here. Let me get that going and get here. This is what's happening, all right? We originally got this for 333000 That's That's what it was. It was 330000 It was actually, you kind of cropped off the top there. Um, but 330 was the purchase price. 3000 was the closing cost. We originally, in two or three days, got an offer from Redfin for $515,000. Are you kidding me? That's $182,000 dollars minus three thousand that we would have to pay for closing costs and that would be a hundred and seventy nine thousand dollar deal Woo! we were celebrating we were high-fiving we were having a great time we were bumped this is may baby may was hot we were going it was it was going gangbusters may boom canceled during their inspection. Next, we got a 485 offer from a hedge fund, a hedge fund that we have been doing business with for the last two years. They had been reliable. They hadn't canceled on anything. Boom, $152,000 profit. They came in at 485 minus 3,000 for closing. That's $149,000 profit canceled during the inspection period. Next, we go, you know what? We're just going to go to old reliable. We're going to take this to our cash buyer database. We've got a solid six to eight thousand, depending on uh, how much Jeremy, my disposition manager, goes in and cleans up our cash buyer database and sends it out to everybody. Really, 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 really solid buyers, and boom, we got one from a guy that we've done a lot of business with. Four hundred fifty-three thousand dollars. That's one hundred twenty thousand dollars profit. Right? He cancels. We always we always require a five thousand dollar non refundable earnest deposit on our deals. So he's like, listen, take my five thousand. Uh, I can't find enough money to be able to do this project. I'm tied up with other things. Basically, that was telling, and my spidey senses were going because I've been doing this since 2004. I went through 2008, nine, ten, eleven, the whole thing, right? I know what it's like when people start pulling back when they're usually reliable and they start telling you stuff like, oh, I just can't find the money to be able to do this and I need my crews for other things. And that's basically I'm scared and I don't want to do this deal because uh, I'm going to just kind of pause right now. So we got the $5,000 earnest deposit. We blasted it out again. Instantly got an offer for 410. That's a $77,000 profit. Do you see that? A hundred and that's a hundred and two thousand dollar difference from the first offer that we got from Redfin. By the way, Redfin just stopped buying. Uh, the hedge fund stopped buying, and uh, so now we're at seventy seven thousand, and we canceled, and and they committed to it at four ten. We had a five thousand dollar non refundable deposit, and they decided to pull out during their inspection period because they got sick. Whatever. All right. So now we're looking at this thing. We're going. What is is happening guys this is within a six week period this is the middle of may to the beginning of july all right that that that, that that's how fast this market turns when interest rates hike up inflation takes effect and it's summertime and the cash buyers are kind of on pause right now and the hard money lenders aren't lending as much because they can't sell the notes that they have because the note buyers are waiting for the interest rates on those notes to go up and start buying at more uh, at higher elevated interest rates right so what are we going to do got to pivot We've got to pivot for this deal. Now, this isn't this isn't what we're going to do on most deals. This isn't what I like doing at all. I like wholesaling deals. I like getting in. I like getting out. But on this deal, we have to fix it up. 
it, it, that there's still profit to be made. So what do we do now? We've got the 330 purchase price. We've got 100K in rehab. We're 433 all into this. Now, based on the comps, it should go for 600, but because it's probably going to take 90 days to rehab this, we're going to put it at 575 as a conservative estimated sales price. All right, you minus the 3.5% that we'll pay for an agent. Our agent takes half percent and puts 3% on the market. Minus the closing costs, you can see See the profit there. 575 minus 433 minus 20,000 minus 3,000 closing plus the 10,000 we got in earnest uh, and we net 128.875. Now we are not rehabbers. We are not designers. We do not. I do not have all this crew. We don't focus on that. We stay focused on ugly houses, big checks. But because we've got relationships in this business, we we uh, worked with the Viking boys, uh, Luke Rotvold and Jake Landis, and they've got a incredible crew you just saw them in action we walked this deal with them on friday they were in there that was shot yesterday on tuesday they've already got the whole thing gutted and they're going to be going uh to town on it and it should be a hundred and twenty eight thousand dollar profit on this i'll keep you posted on all this but look at the difference here I mean, even if we put in all the work and we do all this effort, we're only going to net 90000 because we're giving them 30% for doing the rehab and for doing uh, for running the rehab and doing the design because they're phenomenal. But I'm telling you right now, the properties on the market have to be pristine. If you're doing any flips right now or you're selling it to people that are doing flips, the people that are just doing lipstick remodels are not going to sell their deals, which means they're not going to be able to buy more deals from you you need to filter out your cash buyer database one and two you need to be able you need to be able to go after deeply discounted properties and uh, i'm going to bring in uh my acquisition manager you know him you love him ryan thornton here in just a minute but not quite yet by the way, in the last 12 months, June to June, Ryan and Chad have combined, mostly Ryan on the closing, but Chad on the um, the junior acquisition manager side, warming up the leads, 1,962,566. That's real numbers. Just under $2 million in the last 12 months. So he knows what he's talking about. Get ready and, and get strapped in because he's going to come up here and do something once I stop my rant in a second. Not yet. I know he's like getting ready to come up. But here's what I'm, I'm saying. saying. Will you put in the cash buyer ladder for, for me, please, Matt? Thank you. All right. Yes. All right. Right here. You're going to see this is your cash buyer ladder. We go through this. At the top of it's going to be creative financing because those people are about terms uh, then it is the ARV, the actual price. So remember, on any deals that we negotiate, we either get a wholesale price or wholesale terms. Creative financing, we can lock up deals with creative financing, still wholesale it to people that want to add it to their portfolio. They love these because they don't have to go in full cash to purchase these properties, and they love adding it to their portfolio. Next is hedge funds, owner-occupied, value-add, Airbnb, rental portfolio, Burr, fix and flip, and wholesaler. All right. Let's see what is going on right now with all of these buyers, right? Creative financing is always going to be around. And remember this. Remember this matrix right here. All right. This matrix is very, 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 very key to what you're doing. All right. You've got a high price, you got low price, you've got ugly houses, you got great houses. All right. Now you might be talking with people that have a really nice house and they want a really nice price. This is going to be retail, okay? This could be where you do a creative financing deal. That's where these live. These kind of live all throughout here, but for the most part, um, you want to get good, clean houses for creative finance where people don't have to put a significant amount of rehab in. All right, well, where were we looking at with the hedge funds? Well, the hedge funds, they were high price. They were going high price, and they wanted things right around here. The hedge funds wanted them right around here. Hedge funds, the I buyers, the red fins, the, the, the Zillows, but they're gone. The, um, the offer pad, the open door, this is kind of where they were living right here is in that kind of, it's decent price. Price, and I mean, decent um, condition, and they were willing to pay a high price for that because they have long-term strategy or they were just going to put lipstick on a pig. They are going to get crushed in this market. Watch. It's going to be a bloodbath 
for the open doors and offer pads and those uh, those there. The ones that are going to uh, hold on to them, the hedge funds that are going to hold on to those properties are going to be fine, right? And then you've got owner occupied. Well, owner occupied were willing to pay a high price, even if it was kind of medium condition, because they were going to do their own their own rehabs on these things. Uh, but owner occupied, owner occupied, we'll just do an OO there, make it simple. They're able to now buy properties on the market. Because guess what? The market is slowly building up inventory. In Arizona, we've doubled, in Phoenix, we've doubled the amount of active listings in the last six weeks. Do you see a common thread here? Okay, so they're gone. These guys are gone, right? These guys are gone. The value add properties are gone. The burr strategies that kind of sit around, you know, they're kind of ugly, but decent house burrs right here. Rentals kind of like they wanted a decent price is, is kind of right here. All of these are gone, right? Rental properties, buyers are gone because of interest rates. The, um, the, uh, the, the burr strategies, the Airbnb strategies, uh, well, Airbnb is really here. B and B is here, gone. You are living in this world right here. That's where you're living. You're you're living in ugly houses. That's where you're living. Stop making offers at close to list price on the MLS. You are going to get crushed. I'm telling you. It needs to be significant discounts. We're going to go through all these discounts and we're going to go through what conversations we need to have with the property owners so that you're going after the actual ugly houses so that you can still get the big checks. But all of these other buyers are gone. We've been talking about this a lot, but it's really, really, really important because I get a lot of feedback and I get a lot of people reaching out um, either uh, through DMs or through emails and just saying, what do you think of this deal or whatever? And I'm telling you, it's over. The height of the market, the peak is gone. It's done. Interest rates are going to go to 8%. No doubt about it. It's going to become a buyer's market. No doubt about it. All right? So it is time to start really focusing and having good quality conversations with our actual distressed property owners and with the buyers that are going to stick around that are doing really tasteful remodels. That's all that's going to be left for at least the rest of the year. I mean, it's, a, it's going to be another 60 days of turbulence, but the rest of the year, you got to go after ugly houses, guys, and you got to get realistic. The, the sellers have to get realistic with what's going on because they're not going to be able to sell it. And unfortunately, a lot of them are going to lock it up with people that are going to lock it up too high, and they're not going to be able to sell, and they're going to be super pissed off by the time they get to you, and you're going to have to understand their emotions and work with their emotions so that you can help them solve their problem with this property because it's only going to get worse for them financially for real. So I just have a little bit more. Uh, I just have a few more thoughts here and then we're going to bring Ryan on and we're going to show you how to effectively have really good communication and really good conversations with all these property owners so that you have more tools in your toolbox so that you can still go out there and successfully close a ton of deals. All right. So here's some thoughts. All right. Let's give it a second to catch on here. There it is. Okay. It all comes down to talking to people because we are in the people and communication business. When you are finding deals, we are in the people and communication business. When you are building your business, we are in the people and communication build business. If you don't understand this, you can't build a business. Let me just put the, let me put a fine point on this right here. Okay. Sorry, Matt, I'm jumping around. We know this, right? Cash flow qu quadrant. Robert Kiyosaki, employee, self-employed, business owner, investor, right? For the most part, listen, you could live here and not be good at communicating. You can. You can get a job where you don't have to communicate with people. But if you're here and you're here, you have, you are in the communication business. You're in the people business without a doubt. So the number one skill you have to learn is effective communication. Understanding the four different personality types. Understand how to communicate with them, right? And the more reps you have, the better you are at it. The only time that you can escape it is over here, right? This is when you're building wealth. This is when you can just put your money out there and your money's making baby monies and all of a sudden it's just building up your wealth. But you don't get here without going through this. Unless, you're, unless you're, you get an inheritance, right? 
This, this is the lifestyle that you see on Instagram where everybody's chilling on the beach and they don't have to talk to people and they're just like super wealthy and doing nothing. And everybody's like, oh, I want that. It's fake for the most part. And then the people that are like trust fund babies were all like, oh God, they're gross, right? They don't have to work for it. They didn't have to earn it. They were just given it, right? And listen, when you go through self-employed and business owner and you earn it and you actually grow a successful business, I am telling you it is one of the greatest feelings of all time. Okay? But if you are if you if you've been living in the world of being an employee and you haven't had to talk to a lot of people, you have to develop those skills. Hopefully you've been in a job that you have to talk to a lot of people so you understand how to uh, effectively communicate. But here and here, it's the number one skill. It's where I wear the same t-shirt every single day to talk to people, talk to people, talk to people. Because the, the reps is what's going to get you great at it. The reps is what's going to get you great. Stop trying to live this life before you go through the fires of being self-employed and, and growing a real business. And you absolutely can in this business. And you can do it fast if you just stay focused and make sure that every single day you're communicating effectively. All right? That's number one. Over here, number two, know the hotspots in your market and prospect those hotspots. You got to know where your buyers are buying. You got to know where people want to have these properties. The, the, the properties that are more rural are going to shrink down into, into the cities, into where the economies are in most areas. I mean, only 9% of the, 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 the country is actually populated. You know what I mean? Like you ever get into an airplane and you're just like, oh my gosh, there's land everywhere. What is going on here? We don't have a shortage of land. There's only 9% that's populated and that's because of industry. That's because of economy, right? So find the hotspots and really focus on them. Occasional TTP, occasional conversations with distressed property owners will produce occasional results. Put it in your brain. Occasional, occasionally being proactive will give you occasional results. And occasional doesn't grow a business. So just remember that. Biggest challenge is not knowing the scripts, in my opinion, which prevents you from pre-qualifying and understanding that a lead is somebody that has made the decision to actually sell their home. A lead is not somebody that just wants you to comp it. A lead is not just how much will you give me. A lead is somebody that has actually made the decision that they're going to sell their property. So make sure that you understand that. Make sure that your whole team understands that. They have to have already made the decision. You're not going to convince somebody to sell. You'll never convince somebody to sell. It's just not going to happen. You can, only provide, and you can only provide value to someone that is prepared to trade potential equity for speed and convenience. Can they hear me? Are we good? Okay. Uh, and last one here, and I'll bring Ryan up because that's why we're all here. Uh, since the word no is the most common response, the business of sourcing deals revolves around the word no. Get told no more often to get used to it, to get better. Don't worry about the rejection. Consider it part like doing a rep, a rep of anything, a rep of playing the piano, a rep of learning how to cook, a rep of uh, you know doing a squat at a gym. Getting that big old dumper. You know what I'm saying? Like reps, 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 reps. Get told no and you will win. Okay? Get comfortable with it. That's what we want. All right? And that's my thoughts. That's just my thoughts from coaching. Uh, the most incredible people are um, – that, that I have the, the fortunate coach in my TTP coaching program, uh, the conversations that we have in there. Uh, listen, I know it's the dog days of summer. I know that it's hot. I know that motivation is, is a little bit lacking during this time, but this is the time to really turn it on because I'm telling you the second part of this year can be absolutely incredible if you let it be. All right. So let's bring him on. Let's bring on Ryan Thornton, my acquisition manager, 1.962 million in the last 12 months. There he is. What's up, man? Hey. What awesome. Up? Let's Hello. bring that microphone over. Um, first of all, guys, Ryan um, has been with us about 18 months, right? Yeah, just about. Uh, right the first three months was really understanding what words to use, right? Really right. understanding the skills. Because I had no real estate experience prior to this. Give them your background. So I, I worked as a police officer for many, many years. This one. I, I got I'm looking. I got it. I got it. You guys see yeah. me, right? Yeah. Uh, so I was in law enforcement for a lot of years uh, and uh, kind of did that and got my experience out of it. And then uh, went and got my uh, another degree that I haven't used 
again, yep. <laughs> and then uh, uh, hooked up with this guy, yep. and uh, he got me got me into real estate. He's been trying to do it for years now, like 2004, since he started. I'm like, ah, yeah. no, the hustle, it's not my thing. You know, I'm I, I, no, I'm good. Yep. And then I was just primed for it, and uh, 18 months, uh, here I am. And the first. The first month, six weeks, two months was really understanding. It wasn't really necessarily the process. The process wasn't the toughest part. It was really the scripts. Right. It was really understanding how to overcome the objections and how to really communicate effectively with the with the sellers. Yeah, absolutely. And like I'm I'm a people person. Brent's talking about yeah. communicating. Like that's what I do. I mm-hmm. communicate. I'm I feel like I'm good at it. I was in law enforcement for a long time. I had to do those things. I had to de-escalate. I had to problem solve. I had to do those things. But when it came to this job, uh, understanding the verbiage was really important. And the Mm -hmm. only way I was able to do that was by practicing Mm -hmm. and going on every single appointment, every single opportunity that I had for somebody to allow me into their house and get told no, Mm -hmm. I needed that. You need that. Because you are, you're allowing yourself to practice, you're allowing yourself to get used to that word, and then you're allowing yourself to really regroup and go, all right, they said no. I expected no. Mm-hmm. Now what do we do? Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a couple important things just to get off, uh, to understand if this is somebody that has the motivation and to really understand what is what do they want to do with this property. And I love that you, you go into your appointments and even, I think, phone conversations with what is your goal? What are your goals? Right? Right. What is your goal with the product? You ask two very important questions. What is your goals and how much research have you done? Mm-hmm. Why do you ask how much research? Doesn't that make them like, oh my gosh, they're going to just want Zillow price. Well, and that's what this show is all about. This We run into people that want retail every single day. They have ugly property still and they want retail. Right. Right? Because I, I want to get an idea of where their mind's at mm-hmm. because everybody wants retail. Not everybody understands what retail means, but everybody wants the top dollar price. They look on Zillow, they look online, and they see this number. It fits their square feet, it's in their area, and they want that number. And they really don't understand what that number means. And so when I ask, what research have you done? I want to know, well, okay, so what did you do? You looked on Zillow. All right, okay, and you saw this number. So what's the comparison? Like, what, What is it about that house that is comparable to your house? And does that put them on their back foot? Does that cause friction? How do you do that and make it land so it doesn't make you feel like you're making them feel stupid? Right. So you know what I mean? Uh, or, or you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You like, know, oh, well, what have you done? You, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, I totally get it. So you know, I tell them like, listen, I, I do this job on a regular basis. I'm all over the place, but you live here. You're in this neighborhood. You talk to your neighbors. You're constantly seeing for sale signs. You know this area better than I do, I promise you. So I'm really just trying to get a heads up on what you know so I can kind of implement it into how we can make this process work. Love it. And when you get a lead in and you're going through it, Chad Chad is the first line of defense. He's mm-hmm. following up. He's getting all of uh, he's trying to pre-qualify it as much as possible based right. on the condition, timeline, motivation, price. Oftentimes, you're not getting the real price that they want. Almost never. Yeah. Right. So how do you how do you pull it out? Uh, so basically, off of that question, yeah. like what research have you done, mm-hmm. and uh, what do you what you know if you got that number, what w- what would you do? Yeah. You know, and it's just kind of educating at that point. So okay, so what does retail mean to you? Okay, market value. Okay, well, what does market value mean to you? Right. All right. So you're asking for this price. Uh, how did how did you get there? What what? How does it make sense to you? So I can kind of uh, get an understanding on my end. And so at that point, you're just you're trying to get an idea again, and then educating them yep. on on what it actually means to comp a house. And I've always said this before. It's like, listen, I'll never tell anyone yep. what to sell their house for. Right. I can only tell you what makes sense to us. And what makes Huge. sense to us mm-hmm. are, you know, we have to look at the numbers. I want to get you everything you need out of this house. I want to get you as much value as possible out of this house. So let's work together and try to figure out how that makes sense on both ends. Awesome. Hey, well, you went through your history, which is really interesting, but you forgot one part. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid to, to <laughs> see. Forgot one part I'm here. afraid to see you what forgot that this might. part, uh, Matt. Uh, <laughs> there they are. That's not the part I was thinking about, though. Oh, don't That's even. That's not the part I was thinking about. Uh, 22, how long ago? 22 years ago. Yeah, that, yeah. that is us, uh, yeah, 20, 20 years ago. Yeah. And, uh, no, I was more th- talking about this one here. Oh, jeez. Well, I don't, what is it? I got 
one. It's probably. Is it the calendar uh, one? No, I it's hope not it, the calendar. Oh, okay. It's not the calendar. I feel like there's so many. There he is. <laughs> Edward Forty Hands. Edward Forty Hands. I drank both of those, by no, the way. No, you didn't. I, he no, cheated. I didn't. I poured, I poured most of it out. He cheated. For sure. we, we've known each other a long time. Um, Ryan has always been. You could drop Ryan anywhere, and he is uh, going to make friends and going to uh, be very charming and very uh, versatile. Oh. So, talk to some pe- some people that that maybe are a little bit stuck. Maybe they don't feel like you know the people that label themselves and labels are dangerous. Label themselves introverts. Yeah. Label themselves. Maybe they have an accent. Maybe they uh, have uh, you know they just haven't had a lot of adult conversations for a younger crowd. Yeah. Like how do you how do you get more versatile fast? You know what I mean. So. For everyone doing this job, Mm -hmm. think about how you got into it. Think about your reasons behind why you got into it. Was it something you've been doing this whole time and you were completely versed? No. You got out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. You got into a business that is saturated. People want to do this because people can make money. You got out of that bubble, right? Mm -hmm. And so now that you're here, you have to continue to get out of that bubble. Yep. And I get it. Talking to people is nerve wracking because <laughs> there's judgment or there's criticism or they're going to get they're going to tell you no. Like, I get that. Mm-hmm. I totally do. And the only way, the only way is to take imperfect action and do it. Yep. And so I, you know, I'll tell people like, hey, have conversations everywhere you go. You go to Target, you go to Walmart, you go to the gas station, whatever. You're sitting next to the pump and there's another you know, person. To, hey, you know, how's your day? Yep. How hard is that? But people don't do it because it's uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? But what do you gain by saying, how's your day? And having that conversation. You gain people skills. Mm-hmm. That's it. And you do that over and over and over again. And you do that on appointments over and over and over again. And go on appointments that maybe it's not a deal, but you're getting the reps in. You're getting the practice in. You're going through the script and you're, try- you're navigating, you're navigating those conversations, you're navigating those no's and the rejections and, and trying to problem solve in the midst of all of it. And after you do it, hundred, I mean, how many times? Well, how, how do you get a new skill? How, how many times does it take? I'm sure there's a number involved as okay. far as a habit and a bad habit yep. and all those things. But you do it enough times and that comfort zone, that uncomfortable zone that you had to get into becomes yep. your comfort zone. Well, I talk about... Um, I think to, to, to be able to put it clearly, I think a posture of, uh, of certainty and optimism oh, yeah. is, is, in my mind, what I always think about. You know what I mean? When I see somebody, and, uh, and this is just as I was younger, you know what I mean? And I see somebody that is full of confidence, and they're full of positivity, but they're also, they, they, they demand respect on some level. It's, it's, uh, it's that certainty and the kindness and that optimism that you see, and they have, they have lights in their eyes. They have, they're, they're moving. They're smiling. They're, they're, they're alive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I think just the posture of being certain and being, uh, and, and being likable, and being uh, optimistic and positive, that's, that's, where you, that, that's the sweet spot. And that's a mindset. Yes. You know what it is? Anybody it, it can is. have that. Anyone can have it. And I get it, you know, with things going on in the world and, you know, mm-hmm. people just, they have these insecurities about themselves and it's, it's natural. I get it. I get it. It happens. But that mindset, there are so many things that we can't control right in this world in your life but you can control your perspective on life you can control how you see things your mindset in a in a positive view and that energy that you exude and that you keep within yourself so you can go out and talk to people and make deals and it makes you a magnet it oh. makes you a magnet for other people like that. It makes you a magnet and, and an example for other people that, that want to feel that way too. But Energy is addictive. Feel, it is. It's addictive. It's addictive. Every time I come in here, I like get goosebumps. <laughs> I hear him talk, and I'm like, oh, I know him. I know him. Jeez, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I think, you know, listen, we've set this up for 33 minutes. I think that we probably have enough to enough questions to start going. Alejandra is behind filtering out, getting all of your comments. So if you want to get your comments uh, on the show, make sure you're really, really sweet to Alejandra and tell her how nice uh, she looks today. There she is. All right, there we go. Um, and listen, there's three parts of the show, right? We got question and answers, obviously. We've got celebrations where if you've done something, if you've got out of your comfort zone, 
if you've called somebody for the first time, you went door knocking, you pulled a list, you uh, drove for dollars, you uh, got a deal. We yeah. love ringing yes, for deals. Yes. Nobody rings for more deals. We want to ring that victory bell. And the third part is in the comments, guys, this is your meetup group for today. This is where you, you connect and make sure that you're putting where you do business so that you can find like-minded people because I'm telling you, the right, like the general population does not understand what wholesaling is. Mm -hmm. They just don't. They don't understand what sourcing real estate opportunities is. And so when you go to a barbecue, you go on vacation, you meet the family, it's a family reunion, you're telling them you're excited about uh, wholesaling and real estate investing, they look at you with like glossed over eyes like you're like, speaking what? a different language, <laughs> right? So you know what I mean? Like... Was that an elf? That was elf. I got it. Okay. I know him. I know. Oh, that was a Santa. <laughs> you thing. think about okay, that the yeah. whole time? <laughs> oh, it was there. I know. I know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. Um, so good. Let's pop this thing up. All right, Richard. Got two closing this week. Went on two appointments yesterday. Just left one and still negotiating yes. on one. Richard, we celebrate you. Here I love go. it. Hey. Woo. So I bought that that gong. You did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, we do support calls on Thursday, and so yeah. when people get wins, like a deal, yeah. Brent has a bell, and instead of me going, yay, <laughs> you know, I, I got like a little like gong. gong yeah, thing, I know? love so it. We'll, we'll, yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess that would have been cool, too. Anyway, we'll, we'll try it out. We'll you got see. a gong, yeah. <laughs> I got so a gong. Ryan and Chad do the group support calls on Thursdays for the coaching uh, yeah. students, and that's yeah. been phenomenal. For acquisitions, it's yeah. their favorite. It's their favorite oh, day. I love it. Yep. I love it. We need a shirt with three bananas so people ask, what is that? It's TTP. I like it. I like, I like it. it. It's bananas. I like that idea. It is bananas. I mean, we're, we're playing around with some designs. Don't you worry. It's I'm coming. still waiting for a TTP tank top, but I get told no. But I know. I, I, this I, is a start of negotiation. Some, I'm testing, Tells me no. I'm testing I'm gonna, some stuff out. Oh, okay. I'm testing right. some stuff out. <laughs> I am. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm about to cut these sleeves off. Oh, I'm people do. Yeah. <laughs> people do. Primal. All right. First question about to cold call mobile home park. Fantastic. What are some specifics to ask them, especially when uh, we get to the condition pillar? Well, really, you're you're really talking about a business at this point, Primal. This is this is commercial. This is a big time. I assume that you mean the actual whole mobile home park, not just you're calling on individual owners in that park. That's what it sounds like. Um, yeah. So you need to get the financials from it to make any decisions. That's the first one. You know, you need to know how much they are getting in income you know what what does that business look like it's it's more of like looking at a business than it is looking at like a, a real estate deal right this isn't probably a flip so you want to see how many of those uh what's the income and what's the income potential some sometimes overhead there's yeah. just so many things yeah yeah i mean and you're, you're looking at all the financials and, and you're just seeing is this park uh at uh the market rents is it not at the market rents? Are these newer? Are these older? Are there vacant lots on there that you can add uh, mobiles to to get more income out of it? So you got to find the potential in that promo. Yep, yeah. that's the most important thing. Condition, I don't really care. You, you listen. You can find condition from a Google map. You know that. So just just whoop, look at it and then see see what's going on there. But you want to know their financials. Because listen, a mobile home park in San Diego is a lot different than a mobile ho a home park in. Uh, uh, Yuma. Yuma. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Top home buyers. What's the difference between a rental portfolio buyer and a burr buyer? That's great. So rental buyers typically are going to want that property in pretty clean condition. And rental property buyers um, will oftentimes, if it's at market rents or close to, will inherit a tenant. So if you're talking to somebody that has a long-term lease on that property, uh, you're able to lock that up if it makes sense, if the cash flow makes sense to that rental buyer. With a Burr strategy, they have to get it at significantly lower uh, percentage because they have to um, build in equity to be able to pull out all their money because they do they they do sweat equity they put in uh, they fix it up and make it look a lot nicer so they still have to get it at a good discount um, rental portfolio not as much good question though I learned something yeah, yeah. Zachary hey Brent how have you been evaluating pro properties in low appreciation, low income markets? Mm -hmm. I love it. So, Zachary, here's the deal. 
Um, typically in those markets, those properties are going to be under 150000 Now, I don't think that you should do any deals under 150000 but I understand if it's your market and you want to do a lot of deals, that's fine, but just expect to be paid two to 5000 on average in those deals. Me, I want you making twenty to 50000 on average, which you typically do in the higher markets. But if you're going to go after the low-income properties, one, you have to find a really, like, I would say five really, 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 really solid buyers that that are gonna, are willing to do those. A lot of fix and flippers are not willing to go into the lower uh, markets. One because they have to get them at like dirt cheap prices. Uh, for one, and they just don't come across them as as, as often. And two, um, they have to set up security. I mean, a lot of those times, those those properties get broken into, uh, unfortunately, and either have squatters or have people that rip out all the new stuff and sell them. So you see a lot of areas where uh, it's really tough in the low income, especially as we get into a recession or, or, or just a squeezing of the economy, whatever it's going to be called. Um I, I would highly suggest that you go for the properties uh, over 150. I would even say over 200. But when evaluating it, to answer your question, that's a long roundabout way. Uh, you need to be like, um, if it's under 150,000, you need to be like at 15% of the fixed up value, 10 to 15%. Hmm. They have to basically give you the properties. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Teresa, it's a lot of no's. The other day I called 700 from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. I know you did. And only got one yes, yeah. which I followed up with today. Looking forward to turning in. Let's ring the bell for that. Absolutely. Heck yeah. Look at that. So all that work mm -hmm. got you a lead. Yeah. Got you a yes. In one day, though. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're, that's what we're working towards, right? We're working towards that yes so we can... Uh, just build on it. And let's say yeah, that you're it. building and you're building and you're building and you do that five days a week, mm -hmm. right? Now, I would go nine to noon as I was building my business. Nine to noon, that was my three hours. You went 10 to one, which is fine. Uh, but you do that all the time, every single day, five days in a row. All of a sudden, you get five leads, let's just say. You should be getting more. I mean, some of that is probably the list that you pull. But you have to filter. You have to test. You have to go through this 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 fist fight in the beginning where it's, it's kind of a tornado of... Of uh, your your skills aren't quite there yet because you're not really you haven't had a lot of reps at it, um, and um, you know people throwing things at you. You're not you're not as nimble in your reaction. So as you get better at it, you should be getting more. You should be getting like one deal per hour. You should be getting ten to fifteen leads per week. And let's just say it takes you thirty leads. So it takes you two weeks to get a deal. Right? You should be um, each deal is is 10 to 15 to 20. It depends on the, the market that you're in. Uh, but let's say it's $15,000 average. Yeah. And you do two deals a month. How ridiculous is your life if you make 30 grand a month? And and say it costs you two to 3,000 in overhead and, and whatever miscellaneous costs that you have. So you're netting 25 to $27,000 a month. Is that more or less than you're making now? Right? I'm telling you, <laughs> you can't lose if you talk to enough people. Celebrate the nose, Teresa. Yep. Yep. Second oh, second question. Uh, I have not. Um, Any follow-ups? Uh, I'll do follow-ups if, if I've had a previous conversation right. with them saying that, hey, the weekends are better. If uh, they require it. If, if they require it, yeah. yeah. But typically, I, I try to leave Sundays alone. Yeah, I never cold called on Sundays, Teresa. I have students that have have been wildly successful for it. Because I, I have I have students that are truck drivers. I have students that are police officers. I have students that are teachers. I have students that have corporate jobs. I have students that do all these nine to five. And the weekends is their hustle. Yeah. The weekends is the only time that they really can because they get off work and then they got kids and then they got to eat and then it's late and whatever else. So Saturdays and Sundays is prime time. But I mean, how I mean, how can how much conviction do you have in this business that you work all week long and you're working on your dream on the weekend? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's it's, the hustle. That's, and it's just, you know, when you when you make those calls and, you know, it's, it's you feel like it's going to be awkward, but just have that apologetic kind of tone. That's it. You know, hit that's him, all it is. Hit him right on the nose with it. Hit, hit him. Listen, I know it's Sunday. I, know, I don't. So, yeah. I'm, yeah. For real. Yeah. Any of that. Uh, people think the conversation aspects has to be 100% business. It doesn't. You just have to be yourself in TTP like you would an old friend. In any. In, yeah. You I, see the way that Ryan's talking to you. Like, 
Ryan's been on the show like three, four times, and he's just talking to you like he's known you forever, right? He, Ryan, right? Absolutely. I, I yeah. mean, but, but we're all doing the same thing here. I feel like we're just we're part of that family, right? That's it. That's you know, cool. it's it's like getting together and just trying to solve the problem. And Ryan said it. I'll never tell you what to sell your house for. Yeah. When you go with that attitude, when you get the deal, you know that they made that decision. You don't have to feel disgusting. You know what I mean? You, I'm sure that there's probably been appointments where you probably could have pushed harder oh, sure. and like really got them to go over the edge, but they weren't kind of there yet. You wanted to get them 100%? Because what happens when they're not 100% is they cancel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? That, happened to a deal. And- that happened to a deal in Scottsdale. She, came, uh, she, she, she was a, um, a lead. Ryan went out there. Great conversation. She worked great. We're still following up with her. We yeah, still yeah. feel like we can solve her problem, but it was too fast for her. Yeah. And Ryan was able to answer all her questions and make her feel very comfortable. But her, her her husband had just passed away. And so I don't think that she's gotten through that emotionally and, and understood, you know, you know, have processed those emotions and yeah. then throw this in the mix. It's just and it's hard to tell because I said, hey, I know a lot's been happening. Uh, you let me know. I'm I'm not a pressure guy. Right. So you tell me when you want to start putting things together. This is what's going on. This is what's laid out. Does it work for you? Yeah. And, you know, she said yes. And yeah. I'm like, all right, okay, all right, sure. Went through the process. And then she just, again, it just happened too fast. I feel yeah. like, you know, and, and this is this is going to be a silly analogy, but uh, it, in my opinion, women choose the men, right? <laughs> I do. That, that's my opinion. That's I feel like it's the same way. Like dudes that try to like, like obsess over or really convince a girl to go out with them, it never works out. Never. You know what I mean? Like it just puts you on a, in a weird some, spot. Some of the, the work, the work that you put into it, that's, there's some attraction to that. Yeah, but right? they, they have to choose you. You know, yes. it's the same Ultimately, thing with the seller. Yes, they, they have, have to choose, choose you yeah. and the offer or sure. it's going to end up being a disaster or, yeah. or they're just going to have that remorse, that buyer's remorse that uh, – mm. You know, it might happen in dating if you, you know, <laughs> try, buy- to, try to go too hard, you know? <laughs> yeah, do you call that buyer's remorse? Remorse of some sort. Yeah, it's some just- sort of remorse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, guys, what are some ways to build a robust cash buyer list, people above flippers on your chart? Well, let me tell you right now, JC, the people above the flippers on that chart are not buying. Let me tell you this again. Those clean properties. Now, there are some hedge funds that are out there, but they're real tight. And they're really watching. Now, they might open up again, um, but I would highly suggest you go after ugly houses that have potential equity in them. Mm-hmm. All right? Now, the, the when interest rates go up, the Burr strategy, uh, Airbnbs, and owner-occupied buyers, that really kind of gets wiped away. Because one, for the owner-occupied buyers, it's more inventory for them to choose from. Uh, for two, uh, by the way, we're putting TTP Insider here on here. TTPinsider.com. Make sure that you set up your account today if you don't have it. Like literally hundreds of thousands of free downloads and resources and everything in there that you need. But we have a cash buyer pack in there, JC, that I want you to download and start getting those buyers on your buyers list at the cash buyer pack in the TTP Insider. Okay. Um, but I would highly suggest you go there. If you want to go through the hedge funds and everything, you need to talk to the agents that represent the hedge funds. And that's pretty easy to do uh, in batchleads.io. You want to look for the people that have bought, the, the companies that have bought do, do corporate, right? Um, not individual purchase, corporate purchases. And you want them, the ones that have bought like 50 or more properties in the last six months or so. You can go a year if you need, but typically six months. Pull those. Ryan doesn't deal with buyers, so he's like, I, I have no yeah. idea I'm what like, you're yeah, talking yeah. about. I'm like, yeah, 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 that sounds good. <laughs> Six months, perfect. That's what I would have said. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no, but um, – and then um, look for look for those address – put those address into, into Google. Find out who the buyer's agent was on those and call them. That's who represents the hedge funds, and that's their their filter. That's their, their person that they, they'll put in front of you to, uh, um, to review the deal and submit it. All right? There you go. John, thanks for the insight. Would you recommend us make offers on sellers who have distressed properties but want near retail? 
Well, I mean, yeah, you got to make an offer. You got to make yeah. an offer, John. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. At that point, uh, it's it goes back to just educating them, and, mm -hmm. and you know, hey, how did you get to this number? You know, uh, you know, and then just going off the the comps in the area and just kind of talk about like what makes sense on your end, and hopefully you can find something that works for them. But yeah. it, it, uh, you got to stick to the pillars too. What's their motivation? Mm -hmm. You know, if they're not really motivated, do they want to sell? Do they really want to sell? That's a lead. Yeah. You know, typically when people want retail for ugly houses, they don't really want to sell those houses. Yeah. What's the distress of the property? That's going to give you an idea of the motivation. That's going to give you the idea of the timeline. And whether or not they want retail is is really going to depend on what those things come out yeah. to. They can want retail, but if they got to sell because of X, Y, and Z, that, that's going to come down. And so it's you being patient, educating them and going, hey, I want to help you solve this problem. Can you let me do that for And you me? hit it perfect. It's timeline. A timeline, yeah. So that's that's the number one thing that's going to filter those, John, is the timeline. And then you have to be comfortable asking the question, um, if you don't get this price, what's your plans with the property? Yeah. For real. Like, that has to be in your toolbox. You have to, I mean, you could, whatever way you want to do that, I always felt like that was the best delivery for me to ask was, if you don't sell it at this price, uh, what's your plans with the property? You can say, okay, if you don't get this, what's option B? You know, what's your second option for this? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then if they're stuck on that, then you can go, okay, if I can get you that price, are you willing to uh, be creative with me on the terms? Are you willing for? Uh, are you willing to take payments on it? And then you have to decide if you want to do some sort of creative financing on an ugly house. Yeah. I just don't see those go well um, because typically it's uh, – it's kind of a nightmare, and once you get it fixed up, it's not worth more than it is, and then you have to put a tenant. It's a whole, it's a, it's, it's a mess. So, what I would suggest you do is with ugly houses, cash, 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 then get creative. Yeah, and then I, again, I think again, timeline is super important. Yep. I don't like throwing numbers out there until I know they are wanting to sign with me right then and there. Otherwise, you may not hear from them again because now they have your number. They're going to shop it, and mm -hmm. you know somebody's going to give them ten thousand more, and they'll stop answering your calls. Wait you know a second. I mean? What, what month were you in the calendar? Oh, I don't know. Is it July? I don't know. Is it July? Will you find it? <laughs> Thank you. All right, we got Why another good picture. Why do you get these picture. random thoughts in you? Like, yeah. So, Left field. I was thinking. It was. I was thinking he was, was Mr. July, though. Yeah. I think right. he's Mr. July. Yeah. So uh, timeline's very important. Can you maybe one day have Fran do a live? Uh, do a live, being she is the one making the calls. Theo, um, I could talk to her. I've, I, listen, we've got a lot of plans for this show to be really, really, really creative. I've got Kenny, uh, my new social media that, uh, um, manager that's going to really put some creative ideas. This is going to go bananas. Literally this week, uh, we are remodeling this. We're in a tiny, we're, we're in maybe what? Two, 200 square feet about here. 200, yeah. We're going to have a studio that's huge, and we're going to have a lot of different aspects to the show. Acrobatics. I, I really like want this to be the stuff. greatest show in real estate history, uh, not only for instruction and, and, and action items, but also, you know, just to see real life things. So I, I have to see if Fran would be open to that. I don't know if she's comfortable with having a camera on her while she's making calls. Um, but you're going to find that. Most it, it, when you watch somebody making calls, it's really boring. It's wildly that that's really my biggest fear is that it's just so boring. You know what I mean? So um, I don't mind it because she's what is she at? Like over six hundred? Yeah. Six, oh no, she's like six eighty six. Six eighty six this year? Yeah, six hundred eighty six thousand something like that. That we've earned from her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One caller. Yeah. Everybody's like, I'm going to get 30 callers uh, and pay them $2 an hour. We pay Fran 22 and yeah. she's made us. It's a 20 to 1 return right Find now Fran. for Fran. Oh. I'm just saying, call motivatedsellers.com. Mm -hmm. Call motivated sellers. I've been telling everybody. Everybody wants to you know, get, get somebody cheaper. And I get it if your budget doesn't do it. But if you got the budget, it's, a, it's the Rolls Royce of, uh, of cold callers. So. If you do want to watch someone that does cold call live, um, the Viking boys that yeah. we partnered up with on that last deal, Luke Rotvold actually cold calls and does plays Madden and plays Madden. Yeah. So yeah. Theo, yep. you could always check out his channel. There you go. We might have him come and do the show. Play Madden. <laughs> uh, Jose, hi Alejandra, Ryan, and Brent. Do you go for foreclosures with a sale date? Because until then, they may look at it as free rent, not willing to act. Yeah. Yeah, we don't do a lot of foreclosures. Not a lot, yeah. There's, there's, I, I'm just telling you, there's a 
Uh, it's less than half a percent of the properties in our county, in Maricopa <laughs> County, is, are in pre foreclosure. Um, and 90%, the, and this is the stats, you can Google this. This is coming from, I think Core Logic has this, or Adam Data, one of the two. 90% uh, of people that are in pre foreclosure end up doing a loan modification or getting caught up. Only 10% actually go. Um, uh, actually sell or um, or go to auction. So you got to really look at it. I think the last I saw was it was 240 or 260,000 in the whole entire country are in pre foreclosure. That means you know we have 100 and uh, and 43 million uh, residential properties. 240 to 260,000 is a very small amount, um, but who knows? Maybe that'll go up. Maybe that'll go up. And so. foreclosure uh, homeowners are historically the hardest people to get a hold of. <laughs> yeah, they just they, yeah, they just they just get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. So when they get a lot of attention, they shell up. Yep, and they kind of head in the sand, wanted to go away is, without is acting. He is, yeah. <laughs> I knew you were Mr. July. Check this out. Yeah, Mr. July, right there. That's health promotion made shred that city, bro. That is ridiculous. Shred city. That's pre oh, three man. kids. I'm missing that hair. Bro. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Pre three. I knew you were missing July. I pre I, pre three kids, you. like yeah, like my body just went to hell because I. No, I mean you're in great shape, <laughs> but you're not, you know, Mr. July calendar shape. No, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm in that shape since it actually happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Luis. Thank you so much for these live videos. I have uh, my third fix and flip of the year, nice. and I I deal. Um, you under, see under to contract, under yeah. contract. Oh, sorry. And a deal under contract to a sign in um, Dallas, Dallas Fort, Fort Worth. Worth. All doing it part time. Glory Love be to God. Go TTP. Congratulations, Louise. Yes. Come on. Yes. Nice. Man. Awesome. And by the way, guys, some of the bigger wholesalers in your market are going to start doing a blend of wholesale and fix and flip. So that these are good people to add to your cash buyer database as well because they're going to need to keep their crews going. Uh, and you're going to see the people that were just doing the we're, – we're really banking on appreciation – for their profits are gonna are gonna just get out of the market because they're gonna lose on some of these deals for the first time in in years uh, at least two to three years and so they'll 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 kind of be beat up a little bit so we need the new fresh buyers to come in that are gonna do these fix and flip and it's gonna come from people in our industry uh, typically hmm. historically yeah. Uh, generic, generic name. Generic name. Uh, right. Tips and things to consider while starting to wholesale commercial deals. I really like these. I think that there's a really strong strong strategy here. 100% uh, you have to have a commercial, a lot of commercial brokers in your pocket because they have all the buyers. There's just not a lot of cash buyers that are looking for commercial. Now, some mm -hmm. are, so I would blast it out to your entire list, but you also need to you need to build in those commercial brokers. Something that you will under you, you will find out quickly is for the first like two to five years of a commercial agent's life, they spend eight hours a day cold calling. It's their whole business. It's everybody's whole business. Hotels right. do it. Resorts do it. Uh, Zillow does it like crazy. Zillow is the most gangster cold callers of all time. Yeah. They have a they have a facility of four to six hundred cold callers all day cold calling agents. L listen to this. Yeah. They they cold call agents to send them internet leads when the agents could just call homeowners and get their own leads. <laughs> so Zillow's like, no, 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 no. You just chill. We'll we'll go and get all these leads from our online uh, uh, website, and then we'll sell you these leads so you don't have to call. Like, who's winning there? Dang. The people that are cold calling. I'm serious. This. They call you all the time. I get calls still. Yeah, so do I. Yeah. <clears throat> mm hmm so um, yeah, get in, get in with them, Mr. Energy. What dialer should I use? Uh, we use Mojo. We uh, the, apparently, you know, I had I had a conversation with uh, the owners of Batch uh, this morning. Apparently, they've worked out a lot of the stuff that they had going on with Batch Dialer. I really hope so because I was really uh, proud that that was coming out and it could connect with Batch leads, which is really mm -hmm. easy to use. And so you could text, you could call, you could uh, skip trace, you can uh, pull your list, you could do it all on Batch leads and Batch Dialer. Um, they're still working it out, still a young company, so I, I, I'm confident that they will. But for now, Mojo. 
MojoCells.com. It's the most, uh, they've been around the longest. It's who I used when I was making calls. It's very intuitive and very easy to upload your list and make calls. I got up at 5 a.m. this morning. Really? 5 a.m. Wow. Can you believe that? That that's is, crazy. That's amazing. I've been getting up at 6.30. I woke up at 5 o'clock, like... So, like, on purpose? Yeah. What, what, what are you doing? What are I you was doing excited to do the show with you. You were. That's it. Oh. Yeah. I told you, you right, know. he has been hyping this show I know. Up since I'm last you. Wednesday. I'm you. Yeah. <laughs> Matt. Hi, guys. What are your thoughts on Southern California market? San Bernardino mm. County. Hi, Desert. I've joined with two other guys, completely beginning... Uh, Complete beginners hitting it hard with text blasting. Yeah, that's a good start. You need yeah. to get on the phones, Matt. Um, just, yeah, watch the price point. I mean, some of Southern California is just ridiculous. and it's always been ridiculous. They're, well, yeah. there's, there's, there's established companies that will literally spend 10 to $12 million in marketing yeah. uh, a year, and there's there's... 20 of them in those in those markets to do the renovations and to do the fix and flips and and to buy these properties and hold them and um it's uh you can't compete there you will get out marketed by in 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 those higher priced really desirable areas but get on the outskirts in the high desert great and uh and really text yes also call and if there's three of you listen to me listen this is very 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 important one guy is not the numbers guy, and the other guy is not the uh, uh, texting guy, and the other guy is not the, oh, I'll go drive for dollars guy. Everybody is a Caller. lead generation yeah. guy. You got to be. In the beginning to build your <laughs> pipeline of leads. Now, we're at like 15,000 leads, I think, was mm-hmm. the last that I looked at with with um, with Jackie, our lead manager in our CRM. Uh, I don't need Ryan to be making cold calls, okay? I need him following up with all the leads that we have coming in. Right. So don't jump the line there. Make sure that all three of you guys are hunting because the last thing that you want to do when you're starting out, Matt, is be the guy making all the calls, getting all the leads, splitting it three ways. And you're looking at these guys like, what are you doing? (laughs) How many vacations are you going on? Yeah. How many Fridays are you taking off? This is hustle season. Yeah. Everybody has to be on board. Set a good foundation for that. Everybody mm-hmm. has to be on board. It'll go a lot faster, but for these next 36 months, you're in hustle season, bro. It is it is grind, 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 go bananas. And I'm telling you, you go bananas for um, three years, you're going to be well established. You're, you're going to have things really running. After seven years, you'll be a millionaire. I'm confident in that. Seriously. It just depends. You, you have to stay that consistent, and you have to sacrifice a whole bunch. Yeah. Especially <clears throat> with this economy coming up. How I'm much, just telling you. How much do you want it? Yep. I mean, that's that that, that is what it is. But yeah. once you do, once you come out, once you earn it, <sighs> woo, that is that is nice. That is when you you just feel unbelievable. So there you go. Where can I pull a list or two from Jordan? Great question. Um, we pull, uh, Jeremy pulls it from Batch Leads. Mm-hmm. So batchleads.io, uh, make sure you use the coupon code TTP. Um, and um, you get to test it out and you get to pull some free lists. But um, yeah, Batch Leads, you can you can go in and you can pull all of them. The ones that have liens, you can pull the pre-foreclosures, you can pull, pull um, uh, divorce lists, you can pull tired landlords, tired landlords. multifamily, everything. Mm-hmm. There you go. John Johnson, how do you deal with burnout? You get better. Yeah. <clears throat> That's it. Burnout just means that you're growing. Mm-hmm. Burnout just means that... Uh, you're still in a transition period That's of it. not knowing to knowing. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it's it's really just about staying consistent, and at some point that light bulb is going to go off over your head, and you're going to be like, I know how to do this. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, just keep going, John. Uh, you deal with burnout by being around high performers. Yeah. You, you deal with burnout by reading really good stuff. You deal with burnout by not being on social media to be on social media, to be a voyeur, to, but to use it as a tool to get deals and opportunities and network. Yeah. Um, you get burnout by, I mean, you, you, you avoid burnout by understanding that when you train for a marathon, you don't just go out and run a marathon the first day, right? You run a mile, and, and, and that feels like burnout. 
And then all of a sudden you run two miles and that feels like burnout. And then you build up your endurance. So this is just you building up your endurance. You should be tired. The best pillow at night is exhaustion. For real. So use it. I mean, that's that's part of it. And John, just keep pushing. Keep pushing. And you're doing a lot. You're doing you're doing with the you're you're, you're working with the community. You're getting deals. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're living some, in in what Colombia? Where is he at? Argentina. 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 You know what I mean? You can't get burnt out in Argentina. <laughs> Maybe you can. I don't. Yeah, know. You can get burnt out anyway. I don't. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah just uh, keep hustling, man. You know, I like putting sayings and things in my in my office to remind myself why I'm doing certain things. And so, why are you doing this? What What's your why? And so just constantly read those things and remember what your why is and, and get up and do the hustle, man. I know you got and it. And find somebody that's working harder than you. Always. Seriously. Yeah. When you're running from behind, it doesn't feel like burnout. Mm -mm. It doesn't because you're trying to catch up. I love, I love that feeling. Yeah. 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 yeah that was you. Uh, yeah, I was I always trying to catch you. <laughs> 170 pounds or whatever. Yeah. Not, yeah, like 169. Yeah. Robert, when a prospect gives you a price and you ask what led you to that number and they come back, why is that important? What would be a concise response to that? Thank you. Guys, Get we have Ryan here for another hour. I, Ro Robert is asking the right questions here. Yeah. Like, what are you dealing with out there? What do you think that you're going to deal with? What's the biggest fear of somebody throwing something at you to respond? <laughs> You've got him right here. He's going to give you the responses, and you can put it in your toolbox. I'll just fall asleep. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Let's go. Ask Ryan some questions here. You guys see me all the time. Just ask Ryan some very specific questions on what you know what sellers are saying to you that are throwing you off and putting you on their on on your back foot. So yeah. go so ahead. Uh, Robert, I'll go back to what I kind of said a little earlier in the show. Uh, I say, hey, I, I do this. So this is my job. I'm, I'm really good at it. But you live in this area, mm -hmm. and you know I I'm just trying to get an idea of. What, how, why that number is important to you because maybe you saw something that I didn't yep. and so it's really just me trying to get an understanding of where you're at with your number and if it's even possible for me to get there but it also puts them in a position of power yeah and people people that ask that question want to be in a position of power absolutely and that's and these okay are driver type personalities that are going to hit you with this or it's an analytical engineer type but typically it's going to be a driver type low emotion you know go 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 type of response right why yeah. is that important yeah. that's a driver and you and, you, and then you, let them be a driver let them drive yeah absolutely you go hey i you know i'm sorry i'm not i'm not trying to get too personal here i just i want to understand the area the way that you do just in case i'm missing something because i want to help you uh i want to help you get to that number but i have to understand you know yep. w w why it's that yeah let them drive yeah let them drive that's a great question give us some more questions get it all like time. that Andre. uh michael I put my REI company out there this week, and I got two calls from friends that want to sell their house to an investor. Me. Another friend wants me to talk to his 100 realtors about working with investors. Come on. Oh. Let's ring the bell there for you that, go. Matt. What are you doing? Here we go. There's some traction. You're going you to go, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna go deaf ringing Dude, that you, bell all the time. you have like a thousand firearms. I mean, how do you... Yeah, but I have double ear protection. Oh, jeez. That's yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, that's what I'm going to start bringing here. I'm going to yeah. start bringing ear protection for that bell for all these wins. Yeah, I think I feel I have to go and trick my ears. I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Vasily. Uh, Ryan, why did you leave the police officer job? Seems to me that it's a career that nobody would want to give up. <laughs> Well, it's a great, it's, it was a great career. It, I loved it. It was amazing. It was something different every day. You know, the adrenaline and I, I, I loved it. It was, it was great. Uh, but at some point you have to look at the position you're in. And when that why starts to disappear, you, you, you have to pivot. And so I was, I was working 60 hours. I was a, I was a, a SVU, a special victims unit detective. And I was working 60 hours a week. I was on call all the time. Uh, you know, and I had these, these things in my brain young that I had kids. to take home. I had young kids and, you know, so it was just, it was one of those writing on the writings on the wall, you know? And I was like, it's time for me to do something else because it really went against the grain of my personality. Cause I am, I'm a very positive person. I like to think so. Mm -hmm. And when I went into that job, I had to shift from, Hey, you're not good. You're bad until you prove to me you're good. And mm -hmm. I'm a very much, you're a good guy yeah. until you prove to me that you're not, yeah. you know? And so that's, that's the main reason I, I, again, I love the job. I love it for anybody who wants to put the effort in and they have the why for it. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And I, uh, I'm, I'm blessed every day for, being able to transition out of that job into where I am now. You can only you can only fight your your yourself so much. You know yeah. your your own. You know 
who you are at the my core. My natural, yeah. 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 Guys, if you're getting value out of this, hit that like button. Hit that like button. The more that you do that, the more that it goes out to the YouTube verse and uh, the more people that we can attract in here and squad up and really make an impact and, and, and have people out there that know what they're doing and can either JV with you or partner with you or whatever else. You never know how that ends. But uh, make sure that you hit that and um, that's what that I love. means a lot to us. That's what I love about this aspect of things. It's yeah. like you know being grouped up and squatting up with the people in the group. And mm -hmm. it's like, don't be afraid to do that. Like link up with people, find out what their market is, like yeah. work together and make deals. Like I love that aspect of this. Uh, John, hey guys, should we make our offer anyway on distressed properties, but sellers are wanting near retail or do we instead follow up in some months to see if they've come down? So I, I said it before, mm -hmm. unless they are ready to put pen to paper with me, yep. I don't want to throw out numbers, yep. you know? So, uh, so me, no. If they're wanting retail and we're far away and they, they don't really have a timeline as far as, hey, I need to get this done now. Let's say they have a timeline. Okay, so let's say what they want, they want it quickly. They want to sell now, but they want retail and it's an ugly house. Okay, so it's education. Go listen. Hey, and you got to be real with them. You have to be real. You have to be transparent. Listen, I get that you want top dollar and you should want top dollar. And then you go down the list of how these numbers and sometimes you have to break down the rehab costs and i don't like talking numbers like that but sometimes you have to the timeline is real they need to sell and then you go over the fact that listen you you may get somebody who's gonna offer you they're gonna offer you retail and i i i would i would feel bad if i told you that it, you they would probably have to cancel on you with what's going on right mm -hmm. now and then that timeline you needing to sell in you know a week two weeks it's going to turn into another 30 days another 60 days because you're going to have to start all over again you know so you have to get real with people like that and you don't have to do it in a way of you know oh oh you, that's not you can't do that you're not it's like hey listen are you ridiculous? Yeah, this, this, this what retail? Look at this place. You know, like you, you got to take it down a notch. You got to put that that empathy hat on and go. Listen, I I, I know you want to get this done. Yeah. I want to help you get this done. Help me help you type of deal. Yeah. You know, and it's just you educate them. Like I know you want retail, but th this is this is why retail doesn't make sense. You know, and it's and it's all about your tone and just understanding that you are providing a service and they need to know you're providing a service and not trying to seal their house. Yeah. yeah. You're truth finders and truth tellers. You know what yeah. I mean? You're, you're looking to get the truth out of them, but you also have to tell them the truth on what is realistic for them. Right. We can't help out people that aren't in, in line with reality. Right. Right. And we, I mean, we're not, you say it all the time. We can't, we're not changing people's minds. No. And if they, if they are not receptive to what you're telling them about it, not being in retail yeah. condition, they're not really motivated. They're really not. Or they're, you know, and they're a Shangri-La lad and they'll get their teeth kicked in a few times by people who are telling the same thing or get a canceled deal. And then you just make sure you're continuing to follow up with those people. So you don't you don't wait months. You're still following up. Hey, you know, uh, it, what's a, what's the update with your house? Did you get fig anything figured out? You know, I still like to be a buyer for you. I just you know, we can we can still talk about these numbers or if they get a deal locked up and it's <laughs> it's in a, in a crazy number. Still follow up. Hey, how are things going with the sell? When's your close date? You know, hey, I'm here for any questions. That's it. Yep. Because nine times out of ten, that's gonna fall through, and they're gonna go. Who if was they good actually to me? want to sell? If they actually want that's to sell, that's the thing. Yeah. If they actually have made the decision that they're going to sell this property, and that's the absolutely most important gonna, aspect. It's gonna, of it. ha it's gonna happen. And mm -hmm. if you stay in front of them, you're gonna have a high likelihood that you're gonna at least get the opportunity to present an offer. Yeah. And if they choose you, they choose you. Yeah. Right? Follow up. Just follow up. Follow up, follow This up. is more a question for you. Uh, Austin. Great Brent. to see you, Austin. Hey. Right, hear from you, Austin. Uh, I'm starting to get a lot of follow-ups stacking up that aren't answering. Do you call back every day or once a week or what? How often do people actually answer when you call them? Never. I, I, <laughs> I, so, so, so I'll call twice. Like, even this week. Double like, tap. There's not one person that I called in the, and they answer on the first call. All right. Uh, I, I, I can think of five people off the top of my head where I called, didn't answer, and I called back, and they answered. Right. You know, so I'll, I'll double call, and then uh, depending on what this lead is, uh, you, you got to keep following up. And obviously, you know, you got to triage your leads. What's hot, what's warm, mm -hmm. what's cold. Uh, and hopefully you have that, that information in front of you and have an idea. But if you don't, you're it's a call. 
You got You just got to follow up. I love that you said that. Triage is very, 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 very <laughs> important. I would have a red folder, and I'd have all of it. You know, I had my accordion, C, uh, accordion binder CRM for the first million uh, that I made in this business, and then I had a red folder that was my stalker list. And I found I found yeah. it at my house clearing out my closet. It's really interesting. And uh, triage is basically like if you go in and yeah, thank you for Matt. Matt got my CRM here. There it there is. It is. Look, how, look how yeah. spread out that thing. Look at that. Oh, you well, put some real. You want some real work in there's that. A lot of, it starts out like this, you know, and then it just comes out. You know what I mean? It's, look at this thing. It's just getting all. It's beat up, man. I'll tell you what. what? But listen, um, if triage, right? You go into the hospital. And Ryan has a cold, and my arms cut off. They're gonna they're gonna go and treat me first, mm -hmm. right? That's just how it works. It's the same thing with your really hot leads. You need to be in front of them all the time, and don't get too many leads. Oftentimes, what happens is a lot of people hire um, uh, inexpensive cold callers, uh, VAs or whatever, and uh, they're making calls and they're sending them a ton of leads, but they're not real leads. Uh, and it hides the best leads. Yeah. So you have to really understand, is this somebody that is has made the decision and they're getting close to putting pen to paper on this deal? And that's the difference between a hot lead and a warm lead. A hot lead is ready to sign a purchase agreement in the next one or two weeks. You know what I'm saying? That's a hot lead. And so just understand that. Yeah. So yeah, just uh, follow up and then just have an idea of what your hot leads are, your warm leads are, and that's where it's going to dictate, you know, how oh, much follow great. up you're going to get. This is great. Get Larry here. Larry yep. Cleveland. Mm -hmm. When a potential seller says no to your offer, how do you approach getting an address or email to send an offer so that it's in front of them? Mm -hmm. So they say no to your offer, mm -hmm. but then you're Verbally. wanting to follow up with them with an offer through mail or email. Yep. Written okay. Yep. Um, so I'm Ryan, I, Ryan. Ryan's reading that funny because we don't do it. Yeah, we're we, not uh, going to send them an offer just so that they can leverage it. Yeah, not so, in this market. Maybe as things slow down a little bit and and sellers, you know, are kind of um, you know taking taking understand the, that they're not going to get twenty twenty one prices right. type deal. Well, I'm just saying. If you send them the offer in the last two years, they would leverage that to the 14 people that just called. Them, oh, sure. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if less people are out there going after this uh, because they're not able to sell the deals because they're not watching this show yeah, uh, and they don't know who to sell, what properties to go after, um, I'm not talking about our audience. I'm talking about all everybody else. Um then maybe you can send in an offer and it'll sit there and they'll they'll be like, oh, okay, I have this offer. I'm ready to make the decision. I'm going to go with this offer, right? This is old school, like four or five years ago this worked. Yeah. Um, and so we don't do that. Uh, yeah, I've, I've never You're done that. You're not going to send an offer I, to somebody that asked them to mail. What what, no. what happens when people go, well, mail me your offer <laughs> and I'll review it? Yeah, we don't, we don't hear from them again. <laughs> never. Never. Literally zero. <laughs> Literally zero. Well, I don't have email, and uh, I need you to send me the offer, and I'll review it, and then I'll call you back. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. If they won't meet you, and you're local, or they won't meet a representative yeah. of you uh, of, of your company, they're not they're not serious. You're not going to send an offer to some somebody that's that's like, oh, I don't do good with technology. And then they're like, oh, wow, this looks really good. Yeah. I'm going to sign it, and I'm going to put it in this envelope. I'm going to send it back, and you tell me when I get my money. Right? I mean. Could you imagine that happening? No, I, I can't. Right. Um, I, Larry, just follow up, man. Yeah. Uh, they, they say no to your offer. Uh, understand, you know, why they may have said no, because it's a, it, the numbers don't add up, or they're not ready to sell, or, I mean, Figure out their pain points, and if they have none, then just follow up. Yeah. How many likes we got, Hondra? Uh, solutions. I'm in a hundred. Let's get it to 150, and we're gonna send out a 200. 200? 
Holy. Yeah, we have over 200 people watching. Oh my gosh, this is they love you. I'm telling you. I, you yeah. should just do the show. All right, I'm in hustle season. I'm cold calling almost every day, been doing it seven months, and have netted 50K in Memphis. Bro, Dang. I am telling you solutions. I don't know if you're a bro or your sister or whatever, uh, or a bro sis. I don't know, whatever. Solutions, uh, that is incredible. That's awesome. That is incredible. In Memphis, Memphis deals are like two to 5,000. That's a lot of right. deals in seven right. months. Plus, it usually takes 90 days to do your first deal, not because because um, people aren't motivated, but typically you have to follow up with them, and it takes 30 days to close. But seven months, 50K, give me that. Hustle ball. season what on steroids. <laughs> I love it. Nice, man. Not that we need it, but so that people can see it. Guys, really, and, and I would use this chart here. Just literally draw a line. Um, horizontal and one vertical, and um, on the on the horizontal you want ugly house to great, and then on the top you want price high to low, and figure out where these people are at that you're talking to, and you can you can figure out which strategy to use. Uh, DJ Jen Sway, hello. I am from Boston. I'm a DJ artist. I got my real estate license, nice. and so far I've done three deals. Yes. However, I am wondering what is better, real estate agent or wholesale. Oh, I love it. Uh -huh. DJ. Hold on a second. Congratulations. Yes, three, three deals. deals. Oh, yeah, just for good measure. Uh, <laughs> DJ, here's the thing. Uh, when I was a real estate agent, I was averaging 2.7% commission. Okay? It got to the point where we were making 16% on our wholesale deals. All right? That is way more, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I mean, is that I mean <laughs> here's the difference, DJ. Um, do you want to be your own boss or, or, or do you want to represent other people? Some people love just representing other people because they love um, doing their presentations and they love doing kind of the job interview part of being a real estate agent. Because the fact is being a real estate agent, unless it's like friends or family or whatever else, and even to some degree that, you're interviewing for job for the job of selling their house like on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Right. Um, and you don't have control of your schedule. Because you're at the you're 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 at um, you have to um, be available for when it's free in their schedule to go out and see properties, um, and so you don't you're you're not able to control what's going on. So at, when you get into real estate wholesaling, one you can control your own schedule. You are your own boss, and you get to uh, really see and meet and network with the people that are real estate investors on a high level. And when you're around those people, you become those people. Yeah. I don't think anybody gets into real estate agent to be a real estate agent. I think most people get into well, some people do. Yeah. But I think people get into it to be an investor. I think they get into it to understand real estate. I think they get into it to, um, you know, own rental properties and get cash flow. I think, you know, I would say probably 90% of all real estate agents have read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and they're like, oh my gosh, this is it. So. Um, to answer your question, wholesale. When I, when I was 15, my uncle offered to get me all the stuff needed to be a DJ, and I said no. You did? Like an idiot, because I would rather play video games like oh, an idiot. Oh. So I look back on that time yeah. like all the time, and I look at DJs, and I watch yeah. them do this stuff, and I, go, and I go, You're jealous. God, I'm such an idiot. You missed it. I missed it. I missed my you opportunity. Missed it. So uh, mad respect for DJs. What, what would them. your DJ name be? Oh, my gosh. I have no idea what I mean. DJ Mantis. DJ. <laughs> that was before I was a Mantis, right. though. <laughs> um, we'll think about it. We'll think. Maybe oh, DJ old. July. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it just that needs to get burned. Like, how so do badly. we show <laughs> service to homeowners that are cold called many times? Uh, just just approach it at the very beginning. Be like, hey, I'm sure you get tons yep. of calls yep. all the time, and I'm sorry to be another one. Uh, I just want to provide a service to you, and I'm wondering if that's even something that you could use. Yeah, yeah. Just hit, hit it, hit it from the front. Yeah, you always have to call out the elephant in the room, yeah. and then from there, um, it's your tone of voice. I I can diffuse pretty much most people on a cold call real quick with my tone. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh, I know it's so yeah. annoying. I get these calls all the time. Mm -hmm. I was actually just calling about this property. I'm sure uh, you you get a ton of these calls. Um, is it something that you, you have thought about selling? No? Okay. Do you have anything else? Any other properties? Maybe something that needs some work or a piece of land or whatever else um, that you would consider selling? No? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you most people are getting called from robots. That's essentially what's happening. Not like real robots, but, yeah, like, but like it's like, hello, do you want to sell? I sometimes I answer. I'm these, calling about property one one one. I, I answer one, some yeah. of these calls and it's like, I listen to them and I and I go like this. I have my heads on and I and I just sit here and I listen and I go, wow, I would never sell you my. <laughs> <laughs> it's your tone of voice. Yeah. Remember, your tone of voice is your body language on the phone. So um, I don't know what it is. 58, 60 percent of, of communication is body language. It's, it's the same with your tone. So remember, can you pull up the seven steps to a really good uh, call there, Matt, just so that everybody has it in case they miss it on the on the cold call? For whatever reason. Huh. Well, for whatever reason, when you said seven steps, I wanted to say the seven steps to the best quiche. Oh, OK. <laughs> like, I don't. Why did that? Like, why did that pop into my head? Listen, like. Like, I mean, I like quiche. I don't I, remember the last time I had a quiche. I don't know about quiche. No? I think it's too dry. you got to load it up with a bunch of stuff. I mean, I know, some people it, make a good like, quiche, but whatever. Just, Here we go. Random. If you've never had a quiche, try it and let us know on the next yeah. show. <laughs> you want uh, the seven, seven or the seven? E. No. Period. Uh, give me both. Give me, okay. give, me, give me one and then give me the other. Uh, uh, real quick, uh, Ian, we'll get to your question. Seven steps to being more confident on the phone. Number one is you need to have happy energy. All right, vocal first impression. By the way, guys, this is all downloadable. T2B Insider telling you we put stuff in there every single week. It's absolutely bananas. It's for free. Uh, number one is happy energy. You need a, your vocal first impression matters. All right, number two, do not get on social media before you get on the phone. And this is for follow up and this is for making your calls. Because I'm telling you, you're going to see something on social media that's going to throw you off. And your state. Tony Robbins talks about this all the time. Your state is what it, it really in, uh, impacts the way that you react, the way that the, the frame of mind that you're in. So don't get on social media before making calls. Number three is somebody needs $15,000 of my help today, and I'm going to find them. You need to be optimistic in this. Yeah. If sure. you're not, you are going to get just beat down. Number four, stand up. Number five, smile. Number six, active listening. And number seven, do not be in a dark room. It'll affect your energy. It'll affect your energy. I, I mean, I couldn't imagine trying to talk to somebody on the phone in a dark room. Like a super I feel dark like, room. Yeah, I'd be like, "Hi, my name and is." And sitting Ryan, down. And I. It happens every day. People and, do that every day. And yeah, yeah. And, and. <laughs> no. And here's here's the seven here's the seven steps to being just an absolute superstar. Number uh, one through four is that's your prequal. Every conversation you have with a property owner revolves around those four things. Condition, timeline, motivation, price. What's the condition condition of the property? When do they want their money? When do they want to sell it? Why do they want to sell it? What's their problem that you can solve with a with an offer? And what price do they want? Right? And then the the these the last three of these are the skills. You gotta actively listen. Uh-huh. Sure. Oh yeah. That makes sense. Yep, I get it. Uh-huh. I get I get it. Yeah. Number six, confirm and approve. Okay, great. Four bedroom, two bath. Uh-huh. Sure. Oh, a new roof. Great. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, confirm and approve, right? And number seven is when they when they ask you a question, answer the question. Don't just do the whole if they ask you a question, respond with a question. It'll drive them absolutely nuts. And you're not going to get anywhere, and you're going to cause friction and turbulence in that conversation. So don't do that. Answer the question, then ask the question back. How do you guys determine the price? How do you determine the price? Right? Could you? People do this. You know what I mean? <laughs> how many years of business? How, how many years have you been in business? Are you looking for somebody that's been in business a long time? It's like old school '90s sales tactics. I know. It's like the old school. It doesn't work. <laughs> People know about it. Answer the question and then ask the question. You'll just fall into a group that they already expect you to be I, in. I'm brand new at this. I'm, it, <laughs> I'm a small family business. Uh, I'm really excited about this business. I haven't I haven't done any deals before, but I know um, if, if we can agree on price, I'll do a fantastic job uh, with you, for you, whatever. Right? Yeah. That's. What are they going to say? Well, I need to work with a big company. Okay, fantastic. I totally understand. And then you move on. They're going to ask you that question either way. You, you can't convince people. And don't lie. Never lie. They're going to catch you. Because if you lie, you have to have a really good memory. Yeah, for you sure. You don't have to have a really good memory if you don't lie. 
And I have a terrible memory, as you guys probably know if you guys watch the show. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, you don't, if you, if, yeah, okay. <laughs> this, the whole staff is like, yeah. <laughs> it's from the hits of the head, I think. Uh, All absolutely. Right. Uh, here you go. Uh, e, hey, Ryan, how do you stay composed when dealing with different sellers who are unreasonable and talk over you? <laughs> Oh my gosh. So it really started back in 1987 when I started meditating mm -hmm. and really becoming one with myself. No, um, so uh, you're going to get that because people automatically, you're when talking you were six, to them. You started meditating at Absolutely. six. Absolutely. Wow. You didn't? Wow. You just started getting up at 5 a.m. Like, well, who are you? I don't know. Come on, start yeah. your day early. Yeah. Um, yeah, so E, like, honestly, people are going to do this all the time, right? And so you have to slow yourself down and not go to their level. Mm -hmm. Some people are just going to be unreasonable. And if you get to a point who where they're not wanting to listen to what you're saying, that's a dead conversation. Yep. You know what I mean? So don't, don't waste your energy on somebody who doesn't want to be helped. Uh, so yeah, somebody unreasonable and talking over me and I'm, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm calling about this and you know, you told me this and you're, you're keeping that low tone. You're keeping that, you know, Hey, positive energy. And they're like, well, you're this and, the, uh, 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 and they don't want to let you talk that, Hey, sir, you know what? I'm, I'm really sorry to bother you. Uh, if any point, you know, you, you, you want to, you do want to sell your house and you think my service could, could help you do that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just give me a call back. You know, and, and you leave it alone. But anytime you try to talk over or try to match someone's level uh, on, on that note, it's not worth it. It's not Because who wins? You don't win. They're not going to sell your house at that point. And then they just depleted your energy because it was a bad conversation. And you don't want them taking that from you on, on, a, on one call. So, yeah, just I, I leave it alone, honestly. Like, oh, man, that, uh, the guy that the, your, uh, one of your students was trying to buy the house and mm -hmm. he said that, Anyway, it was a text that I sent you. The, yeah. Uh, the, should I are tell? Gonna, uh, yeah. All right, so I went and saw this house, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we started talking about numbers, and he ended up telling me that I must not be good at my job because I don't know how to do math, and that my wife should be the one doing the job and helping, with, helping me. Yeah. And I go, oh, wow, that's, that's a low blow, man. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, your husband. I've met plenty <laughs> of guys who like getting effed yeah. in the ass and sell houses. And oh. I, go, I go, well, that's the end of this conversation. And then I, and then I hung up. Yeah. yeah, but it was like, it was like uh, you deal with it. You Listen, deal with you it. don't yeah. have to do business with jerks. No. You no. don't have to. There, there, there's some people that you know are are rough on the edges and they'll get aggressive, but you can calm them down typically by uh, matching their tone and then calming it down. Mm -hmm. You know, and then um, you decide if they just have a tough exterior or if they, you know, are yeah. just jerks. You have if to they're decide. Jerks, well, you they're don't not, do business with you, them. You have to decide whether or not they're they're being unreasonable because they're scared, right? Yeah. Or they're being unreasonable because they really have no intention of selling their house and they just want to placate on the fact that they've gotten all these calls and you're just lucky number 28 to get the, the brunt of whatever he has. Yeah. They have. Yeah. You, know, so, you don't uh, have to deal with it. And, yeah. and listen, some, some people just have bad personalities. Sometimes you go on a date and they look great, but they're just terrible personalities. It's true. You know what I mean? That's just It is what it is. Yeah. You're not going to marry them, right? Yeah. Just because they, they want to do... You know what I mean? Like... They're trying to convince you of something. Get get out yeah. of here. Hey, E, don't let them take your yeah. energy. Don't yeah. let them take your optimism. People are just just nasty people sometimes. And you and you. And there's on. too many deals. There's too many deals. Move there's on. 14 million opportunities every year. Mm -hmm. 14 million. There's like, I don't know, maybe 50,000 wholesalers, and I think that's high. You know what I mean? Maybe 35,000 for 14 million. We got a two part question. I'm going to do the math on that. Look at this, Brent. Yep. Look at this comment. That's 400 deals each. All right. Oh, let's uh, go. Novice, I'm thinking about quitting my mail outs. What list should I start cold call with cold calling? Driving for dollars. Hmm. Driving for dollars, 80% of the first deals. That's that's how I did all my the first 20 deals was driving for dollars and putting them in this beauty right here. You know what I mean? Like right All here. All stretched out. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, driving for dollars. Uh, Dealmachine.com. Use the coupon code. T it's the biggest discount they give you. Um, if you use the TTP coupon code. They love this audience. They love you guys because you guys stick around. It's actually the longest. There's not a lot of churn in, in, um, in this audience, which is really cool for them. 
Obviously, they want to make as much as possible. Uh, the uh, the novice wanderer, best time to cold call is when you can be consistent. Yeah. Let me put a word in your brain, novice. Um, sustainable. I think it's more powerful a word than consistent. It has to be sustainable because you can be consistent for a week. Is it sustainable for a year? Is it sustainable with your current responsibilities? Is it sustainable with everything else that you've got going on? Sustainability is really, really, really important with your proactivity. So sustainable, proactive, uh, building the skills, understanding, using those seven tips to be uh, uh, confident on the phone and those other seven uh, skills that you need to really control that conversation and really pull out to see if they're a lead, uh, you cannot lose. Do you think your 5 a.m. Uh, wake up is consistent or sustainable? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not there yet. Yeah. Uh, what would you neither. do? Neither. If you, wa- if you woke up at 5 a.m. every morning, what, would you work out? Would you, would you read? Would you meditate? Like, what, what do you do when you wake up early like that? I got to work. You got to work. Yeah. I love it. You did something. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I uh, I had a lot of things on my mind. Yeah, okay. We've got a lot of moving parts. We're bu- buying this we building. Um, we've got uh, that flip going on. That's just, you know, what, whatever. We've got a lot of new leads coming in. Jeremy did we're just talking, ask me. Yeah. We're talking to, um, I need to clean, we need to clean up a lot with the pay-per-click leads. That has just been a punch to the gut yeah. this year. Uh, so that's been interesting. <laughs> um, I need to find another Fran. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, on the coaching side, I get, uh, you know, I got a lot of people from the East Coast that are already up. Yeah. So it's 8 a.m. to them. So there's responses there. And um, and Bo woke up at 528. Nice. So he's not. I sat outside at five o'clock for the first time ever, probably. And I'm just enjoying. I'm like, wow, this is what morning people do. Yeah, this is it's yeah. OK. It's, it's pretty cool. It's nice. Uh, and then Bo's like. Yeah, <laughs> five twenty-eight. I'm gonna knock on the on the on the big slider, and I was like, okay. He's like, relaxation's over. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Michael, how do you get the best practice at comping? Probably the most essential skill that we need. Um, one is, I think, in as you're starting out, you can do a lot of damage going with realtor.com zillow and redfin adding them all up dividing by three as a general um uh, arv after repaired value because remember when you're looking at internet sites like uh, zillow redfin and realtor they're assuming that the property's top notch totally fixed up Mm -hmm. okay and then what you want to do is you have you have a couple options here. You can you can have somebody that you squat up with that's another uh, investor. I really like finding local real estate agents. I mean, I was one, and I did this for people that were that were wondering what the prices were. People that know the areas really well and saying, "Hey, listen, I'm buying this property here. If if you're getting close on a deal, I'm buying this property. I want to fix it up. I need an agent in the area. Once it's totally looking beautiful, what does this sell for?" And they'll tell you. I mean, they'll run the comps. They'll send you the whole comparables. They'll do this whole this whole thing for you, right? They want to earn your business, um, and that lets you get really good at understanding different areas. And then from there, it's the only thing, you know. <laughs> Tom Kroll, um, my uh, original uh, wholesaling mentor, he said that um, assumptions reduce victories is what ARV really stands for. Uh, and he said, lock it up and put it in front of your buyers and let your buyers tell you what, yeah. what the values are. Mm-hmm. I think that you can, you, can do, you, you can do some damage that way, but you can also fall into being a cash buyer employee yeah. and selling the same deals to the same buyers over and over and over. So it's a dual-edged sword there. Um, but yeah, yeah, understanding values is, is really important, but the buyers are going to tell you. Because listen, Number one, number two, biggest um, challenges when you get started. Is it a deal? How big of a deal is it? That's it. How big is it a deal, and how big of a deal is it? That's what you're dealing with there, Michael. So it's reps. You can do you can do a pretty good job there. But then just go through and go through the. Comp- I, listen, I have a whole. Do we have the? Do we? Is it? Can you pull up the seven steps to comping? Uh, find that in the, the archive. We'll pull this up for you, Michael, if you stick around for the next few minutes. Okay. 
Uh, oh, wow. wow. Okay, Matt. That was fast. There you go. So the seven steps of comping there. Uh, number one is uh, you start with the location. You start with the neighborhood first. What are the comparables in the neighborhood? What are the comparables within a half mile and then a mile? Just depends on if you're real rural or if you're in, um, you know, the city, right? So neighborhood first, half mile, then mile. You don't want to cross any major streets or any uh, highways or, or canals or whatever else. You want to kind of stay within uh, where there's common uh, architecture, Right, that's the biggest difference there, age and architecture. Number two is the timeline. I always look 90 days out, three months, and then I have to go six months and then a year out. Uh, age, you want plus or minus 15 years. And by the way, guys, this is the appra this is what appraisers use. And uh, the reason this is important to understand what the appraisers use is because your end buyer is going to sell typically to a conventional buyer that's going to get a bank loan that an appraiser is going to have to um, determine the value on. So 15 years plus or minus on the age, size uh, of square footage plus or minus 15%. You have to match up the floor plans. If it's a one story, match it with a one story, two story, two story, uh, single family, multifamily, townhouse with townhouses, condos with condos, land with land. They have to be like for like, all right? Number six is the condition of the property. How is that condition? And how much will it take to renovate and rehab? And seven, what is the potential? What will this sell for when it is absolutely looking gorge? So as far as location, yeah. and you know, obviously if you do a comp and one of the the house that you're looking to buy is on a major street. Can, can you pull this up? I'll a major you. street, yeah. right? I love this. Yeah, yeah. So you're a major street, your house you're looking your target house is on a major street. Yep. You you, and you look at a comp, and the only comp you have maybe is within the neighborhood, not on the same street. What are you? What are you taking off? Like as far as value, what's the what's the if rule it, of thumb? I'll, I'll show you right here, and, and it's a huge difference yeah. if it's a major uh, deal. I don't know what's happening here. It's not. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, uh, if you look here, and let me just. So you'll see here when I'm looking at these comps. I don't think I can draw on this. Um, I'm looking north of Cactus Road. So Cactus is this this main road here. I'm looking at this triangle first to run the comps, right where our property's at. And, and this little section over here, sorry guys, it's a little bit lag because this, um, it's, it's monsoon. No. It just does this. No. Um, but I would just pull it up in these areas. But look at this one over here, if you guys can see on the far, far right that's on the major road, you're gonna see it sold for 362. 362 right here. This property in is about 1,200 square feet. Look at what this one's selling for. That's 1240. Yeah, that's 550 versus 362. It's on. Major, There's a huge a major difference. Street. Yep. There's a huge difference. So you got to be careful with that. Yep. <clears throat> Sorry, that's not very clear if you're looking on your phone, but yeah. you want to stay in those areas. And we could do it. We could do a, a RT is a stud. Chad says. <laughs> uh, oh, he's just saying. Hey that. guys, <laughs> get, you better connect with Chad. Chad's our Chad's uh, our um, our acquisition manager as well, and he does the heavy lifting for Ryan. Yeah, pretty much. He makes Ryan look real good, and then Ryan <laughs> goes and closes. But um, make sure that if you don't follow Chad and don't know Chad, you get in his uh, in his world. And he's incredible. And Chad is pretty much as new as most people yeah. on this call. Chad was door knocking, selling solar, solar. during COVID, July of like. Wait, was this this was two yeah. years ago? Yeah. Or has it been two? Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, Osvaldo, I talked with a local flipper in town. He said I could intern for him. I would really like a mentor to get ahead faster. Is this a good idea? Absolutely. Why wouldn't it be? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just depends on what, what they want you to do. Osvaldo, it, it depends on if it's a flipper... And they're like, hey, I'll show you how to flip properties. That's great. But you really the skill, the fundamental skill is learning how to source deals. Matt, can you pull up the wholesales, the foundation, and all the other things? When you learn how to find the deals, you can do all the rest of it. I love this graphic. Discounted properties is the land that you build all these other things off of. Right? Look, you've got five other things that you can do once you're able to find discounted properties, which is essentially AKA wholesale. Hmm. Fix and flip. Rental portfolio, development, being the bank, coaching and mentorship to somebody else. All of those things you can build after you learn how to find deals. Now, you can go and you can start flipping right now and get deals from wholesalers, but you're not getting the biggest deals. You don't know how to find the deals. You know how to connect with people that will bring you deals, but you're going to have to pay them handsomely, like us, <laughs> to be able to find you those deals. So find... 
Find the skill. If they if they're gonna show you the skill on find on sourcing the deals, which I assume they will because they want to get those deals, um, then great. Just make sure that you know you can make something from it. I don't know. When I hear intern, I hear like free labor. Yeah, free labor. <laughs> which is okay if you have no expenses. Right. Um, and Oswald, uh, Osvaldo, maybe you're maybe you're young, maybe you live at home, maybe you're just getting into this, maybe you don't have a ton of uh, overhead. But um, I always found that people that work for free work for about um, ten days to six weeks, and then they they find something else to do. Wally Abbas, sellers are living in three months ago prices. After showing them data, mm -hmm. they are negotiable. How do we overcome that? Move on to the next. Yeah, it's just we're in this this transition period, yep. right? Where sellers are they do they think they're going to get uh, those same you know over retail prices, and they just they need to be educated. Uh, they understand, and I and I I've been asking the question like, hey, have you been paying attention to what's what's going on in the market right now? And most of the time, I I, I know they're going to say no, or they're going to act like they do, but they don't. But I still want to ask that mm. question so they know something is going on in the market right now. And uh, so it's it's really just about educating them as far as the prices and and uh, that we're 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 not we're not buying 2021 anymore. Like the uh, housing supply is going up, and yep. that's just going to change things as far as how people are buying houses. And I again, I don't want to take away from what you want from the house, uh, but I, I also have to make sure that you uh, you have an understanding of where my my head is at and what we're able to purchase at. Uh, so yeah, just nego uh, just. Uh, just educate, and if they're not wanting to negotiate and they won't budge, be like, hey, I, I mean, I totally get that. Um, thank you. <laughs> and, you yep. know, and, and you follow up. You know, But there's no sense in pushing people who want three-month-ago prices when we're, no one's buying at those prices anymore. So educate. Uh, let them know you can be a resource for them, and then let them kind of talk to some other buyers who are going to essentially tell them the same thing, and you, you're doing your best follow-up, and they're going to come back if they're really motivated to sell. Yeah, and listen, it's reality. Who are they <clears throat> going to sell the houses to? Yeah. I'm telling you, they will if they want if they actually have made the decision <clears throat> and they're going to sell because they want to like I'm telling you it is a falling knife and you can use that analogy with them and hopefully they understand that. They're going to lose value every day that they are not selling this property. And if they want to sell it to somebody else, that's great. And it's, if it's way higher than you, fine. That deal will come back to you. This is going to be the the next six months is going to be the most backup offer um, uh, uh, strategy of all time. I'm just telling you, a lot of deals are going to fall out. We, oh, all right. Let's do Fabian. And then I want to pull up this map here, and I can do a little bit better job with with Zilla here. Um, Fabian, I locked up one. I, I'm locking one up that I mailed them an offer because they traveled a lot and they were like 80 years old. That's great. So you're first this, of all, let's this is going back. Yeah. This is going back to the question about mailing out offers. Yep. Right. I mean, obviously you're in the minority, man, and that's that's awesome. And we're not saying if uh, the only option you have is to mail an offer. Do it if that's the only option you have. Absolutely do it. And in this case, you uh, you got something. That's that's cool. That's awesome. Yo, Pace, there he is. Awesome. Welcome, Pace. Yo, Good everyone. to see you, brother. Um, listen, right here. Here is if you look if you look at these. Um, hold on, we'll just go satellite on this. When we're looking at this property and our property sitting right here, I'm comping in this area, this triangle here. Is that 36? Yeah, this is 36. I, I'm not going to go south here if I don't have to. I'm not going to go north of this like uh, wash area uh, if I don't have to, right? And uh, and th this is gonna this is gonna really give me the idea. Now, if there's no sales, which would be rare in this area, then I would then I would go out a half mile from here. And I'd have to cross the major streets, which an appraiser would also do. So, um, yeah, that's that. That's what you now. If you're looking, if you're over here uh, in this neighborhood, I would look at this whole block right here first um, before I get to a major street. Sorry, let me zoom out a little bit. Next major street is here. I could look within this whole area for these comps. 
right? Because there's not a major street. They're probably built in the same uh, the same time uh, yeah. and, and similar construction. So I would use this whole area and then expand from there. So nice. look at Pace jumping in on here. Love you, bud. Uh, he's probably uh, just closing the deal. Just saying hi. But there you go. What was your toughest negotiation? Toughest negotiation? Mm. Oh, mm. what would be? I mean, I feel like there's always hurdles to jump through, right? You're always trying to solve a problem. Right. Most, most of the time I've been told no before we actually get anything locked up. That's just the nature of things because yep. I drop really low anchors. Yep. Um, so I guess the I, I can't pinpoint one specific. They one. usually aren't tough, Ralph. Yeah, I mean, if you if you set the foundation, you're going yeah. through the pillars, and you have an understanding of what they need, what you can provide, and you're you're expressing that to them, and and they really do truly want to sell, and the numbers make sense. I, that's most of the things that we lock up anyway. Yeah, because you're not changing anyone's mind. I think the toughest thing for us is just getting it for less, yep. right? And a lot of people they, they hear a number that works for you, and it works for them, and they go, "Awesome, let's do it." But then people don't they get out of that comfort zone. They don't want to get out of that comfort zone and drop that that low anchor to try to increase your spread. So that's usually the tough part for me is is, hey, I want it for, you know, two hundred fifty thousand. And I go, hey, that's awesome. And, and I, I, I want to get you that. Can I tell you my happy place? I, don't laugh at me. You know, I, I'm just going to tell you what my Shangri-La number would be. I really would like this at one eighty, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's the anchor. You love that Shangri-La. I, I, I do. I love Shangri-La. <laughs> and they go, absolutely not and i go well how close can you get yeah you know and then that 250 turns into you know 220 or you know whatever it is so that's usually the tough the tough part uh is just trying to get a bigger spread but locking up a deal in itself if if everything's primed yep. it's it, it just so works out when it gets tough ralph is if you don't get your numbers right and you need a price reduction yeah that's the toughest negotiation the toughest negotiation is when you have to go back in and it's, and it's rare that we have to do it. Um, I think we only did time. it twice yeah. last yeah. year. Yeah. yeah. And um, and so that's that's usually when it gets a lot tougher. On um, If you follow the TTP method here and actually pre-qualify and stay in front of them and really understand what their goals are and really understand the research that they've done, um, it, it should be a natural conclusion to you pre-qualifying and doing your lead follow-up should be them signing the contract. You know what I mean? You, it, it, people think it's tough when if somebody wants a significant amount more and they don't want to come down. Well, then they don't want to come down. Yeah. Then it's just a timing thing, and uh, and a reality setting in thing. So it's really not like tough negotiating. It's only tough when you don't lock it up at the right price. Remember that deal we locked up and berg had had me go renegotiate the price because he couldn't find a buyer yeah and then we got it a lower price and then berg found a buyer for like way more than we yeah. thought i felt so bad for lowering the price yeah. like we gave him the money we back. Gave I, it back. I, remember, I remember calling you and going hey here's the situation yeah. we just dropped this thing 10 grand yeah. and we're making 45 out of it I, I, we i think we should give this back and yeah. brent immediately is like yep absolutely yeah you know and 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 then it just turned into that that was like one of maybe two times we ever had to like go back and redo the price yeah but i mean i, I mean if you're making money on something i mean yeah it's don't 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 needle them to death don't no. don't don't kill them with a thousand needles type of thing uh john guys i'm about to cold call feeling really confident yes. let's go let's go let's get a deal I want a massive deal, John. Stop messing around. Uh, interestingly, if you'll put my iPad on, um, interest rates did take a dip, uh, which is kind of interesting um, here uh, a little bit. And something you'll see here went down just oh, yeah. a teeny little bit here, right? Just a teeny, 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 teeny bit. Um, and what's going to be, what you're going to see happen here, guys, is as interest rates go up, this is very similar to when I got started in 2004. Um, we would negotiate, um, and this is for anybody out there that's doing flips, um, that, that wants to really make their deals uh, juicy or, or, or give this strategy to their, um, their cash buyers is, um, you can pay. You can buy down the interest rate by paying points, and a point is one percent. But the interesting thing about that is it could save them. Depends on if they they stay there a long time. It could save them thousands on the back end with a lower interest rate. You can buy down interest rates to a certain point. 
So um, people, you're going to see people starting to offer, hey, listen, buy it here, and I'll give you three points, five points, whatever, to buy down your interest rate, which makes it a lot more reasonable for the, um, the payments. That's going to be a strategy coming up, and I'm excited to break that down some more. If you guys are interested in that, if cool. not, uh, we don't have to dig into it. There you go, Nathan. I just signed up with Call Motivated Sellers. I'm hoping it works out. Don't hope. Just make it work out. Everything they send you, get it. Make sure that you are making, uh, having conversations, Nathan, every single day. I like doing a, uh, a morning huddle with them for 15 minutes every single day for the first month to six weeks. This is the list. How's it going? Let's get pumped up. We're, we're helping people save their house or save their credit or, or, um, or, or get rid of this, this, this huge stress that they have in their life. Like, let's go out there and make a difference, right? That type of thing. Um, and that'll really help it. And it'll give you a good perspective on if you have good lists or not. Uh, I used Filipino. What? It, oh, sorry. I used Filipino callers. callers and got zero deals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Brandon. How do you find rental portfolio buyers? I have five property portfolio in Chicago that I'm looking to sell. Please help. Batch leads. Batch. Go to batch leads and look for, um, do, do a search for people that own 10 or more properties. And then call them up. Call them up. Yep. And then it, you got to see if they fit with hedge funds or not. But um, they'll pay the most hedge funds. You could you could also filter through that and then um, yeah get the people that own a bunch of properties. Freddie, are you using Mojo Dialer when making follow up calls? No. no. Will double dialing lead to being marked spam on those lines? No. What 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 do you use as your caller ID? Uh, Sideline? No. Google. No. Number? Google Voice. Google Voice. Yeah. And then call rail when we do out of state. Nice. Yeah. Okay. What do you use call rail for? Florida mostly. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. Yep. To just have a local mm -hmm. color ID. Yep. Armando. Solopreneur. When being a solopreneur with cold calling, how can I follow up with the leads? How does the conversation start? So, following up with cold calling, how can I follow up with the leads? How does the conversation start? So, I, I mean, it starts oh. with. Well, I think. All right. So, if you're talking about cold calling, yeah. first of all, get the TTP script. Yeah. That's how you do it. Um, go to ttpinsider.com, get the cold calling script, and then just use it. That will help you get yeah. the conversation started. And remember, uh, Armando, when you ask them if they consider an offer on their property, they only have six responses. Yes, no, maybe, how much will you give me, who are you, and how would you get my number? So learn how to respond to those six responses, and you crush, bro. Get them. Uh, what would be a good list to pull on batch leads if I'm looking for a personal property? Oh. Is there an alternative TTP script for listed properties? Or that's a two-parter yeah. uh, and to two totally different <laughs> wa uh, wavelengths. Okay, uh, JF, you're really putting me on my toes here. Um, with batch leads for your personal property, find whatever neighborhood you want to live in, uh, search it. I mean, pull pull all the the addresses, skip them, and call them. Easy peasy. So that just depends on where you want to live for your personal property. Um, I think it's kind of this question is probably more geared towards him finding a personal property that is listed. And he's trying to figure out the conversation as far as that would go. Uh, well, with a realtor. he was asking batch leads for personal property. Is there an alternative TTP script for listed properties? Uh, that's having conversations with the uh, agent. First of all, you shouldn't. I, I don't think that you should be going after any properties that are just hitting the market. I would wait till they've been seasoned in most markets 30 days. Um, and if they've been on the market 30 days, that tells you that literally every human on earth does not want to buy it at that price. <laughs> it's expi it's out there for everybody, right? So how nervous are the sellers? And I would call up the agent and say, hey, listen, um, I'm an investor. I'm looking for properties that I can, you know, um, put some love into and make them special. And I'm looking at this property. What offers have you guys rejected? To see if they're open to saying that. Well, I can't disclose that information. I'm not going to tell you that. Blah, 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 blah. You're not going to get that deal. I'm telling you. Not yet. Call them back in a couple weeks. See if they still have that same attitude. <laughs> right? 
of the agents. That's who you're talking yeah. to. And then from there, you just call, uh, you, you just see. And when they respond to you and you tell them, well, we rejected this, 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 and this. Okay, what's the bottom line? Are these people going to be reasonable? Do they understand how much, you know, construction costs? Do they have to sell it? You want to kind of get them in and use your tone to break down their barriers so that you can pull out a lot of info for them, from them. Two-parter? Last one. Teresa, just got off the phone with seller whom I've been following up with. He's ready to sell. Like yesterday, like yesterday, but his ex-wife is making it difficult out of spite. Mm -hmm. He wants us to talk to her. She How do we terrible. go? She sounds amazing. Uh, <laughs> about this, he mentioned she's 80 and not in great health, but still holding on to a crush. Is she on title? <laughs> yeah. Like, if yeah. it's his ex-wife, what does the divorce decree say? They should have split up assets, Teresa. She's 80. Do they just get divorced? How long have they been divorced? How long have they been divorced? I know. Good Lord. Um, I mean, there's, there should be a divorce decree that's going to tell you what's happening with their assets. So he, she might not even have any rights to this property. Now, if she owns the property and he doesn't, that's a different story. Or if they're both on title mm -hmm. and you need, obviously, both of them, then you, you call her and go, hey, um, <laughs> this, this is what's they going on. They got married on. in Barbados? Is that... Um, like like when? <laughs> like nineteen sixty five? Like what <laughs> I said, hey, Barbados was popping in sixty five. Yeah, that was what I'm saying. Popping. Like, uh, so, yeah. So Teresa, uh, fi figure out you know if, if they're divorced, wh who's on title, who is really making the decisions. Is he just trying to play it off, saying, "Oh well, I want to sell, but you know there's this and this and this." Uh, find out the kind of underlying issues. See if uh, he's so really. Speak. See if they're both really on title. Yeah, and if they both are, and, and you need to have a conversation with her, then you have a conversation with her yeah. and kind of figure out what she needs in order to get the process uh, going. So they got married, but they're both on the D. Oh, I see what's saying. So they got married. They weren't like legally married in the United States, but they're both on title here. So okay. they did, the divorce didn't break up the property. All right. So they're both on title. Holy cow! We, yes. Man, we are problem solvers. I'll tell you that. Um, yeah, give her have give a conversation her with her and tell yeah. her: Do you want to take advantage of the market as it's coming down, or do you want to wait till it's bottomed out? Bottomed out. Yeah, for real. It's the same type of conversation, you know. And I and be transparent. Like, listen, I I talked to your ex, and you know we've talked about X, Y, and Z. He says that you're a, obviously you're a big decision maker in this, and we want everything to work out uh, for you as well. So let me know what it what what you need out of this in order to get things going. And he still loves you. He just can't. Yeah, he just can't. He actually he, wants to get back together he can't with be you. The person for you know. You. <laughs> 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 he sent me this picture of you guys in Barbados. I know. It looks oh, it's amazing. Just remember oh, those times gosh. and sell me your house. Yeah, that's it. Just and sell me your house. <laughs> that's it. All right, come on up, Drew. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. You guys are the absolute best, 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 best. We love you so much. I love these um, shows. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It's amazing. Um, so uh, on behalf of everybody, on behalf of Aaron and Matt and Ryan and Alejandra and myself, we love you guys. Thank you for joining us. Remember... Keep your house clean. This house, too, right? But at your, your literal physical house, keep it clean. Car, too, but your house especially. All right? Protect your health and increase your value to the world, and you'll live an incredible life. Love you guys. See ya.